Hey friends, I'm back with a recap of days five and six of the Karen Reed trial. This is Presume Legal. I'm Misha Janice, an attorney licensed in both New York and Florida. Before I get started, thanks so much to those who wrote sweet notes telling me and my little chili pepper to get well soon. He's back to school today and I was back to watching the trial. So in covering this trial, I knew that it would be difficult to do daily uploads just due to time constraints and adulting and mothering responsibilities. So thanks for bearing with me yesterday. Just know that it probably won't be the last time that there will be combined recap recap days. With that said, let's get into a recap for days five and six of the Karen Reed trial. So this is going to cover Monday, May 6th and Tuesday, May 7th, 2024. Yesterday, we started off with a bang absolute fireworks before trial started, before the jury came into the courtroom. We had defense counsel raising the issue of Katie McLaughlin. Remember her? She's the paramedic who spoke directly with Karen Reed at the scene, but who also severely downplayed her relationship with one of the Albert family members. You'll recall the Albert home is where John O'Keefe's body lay in the snow that stormy January morning. When this witness was asked about her relationship that she had with Caitlin Albert, she stated that she went to high school with somebody with that name. The defense through voir dire was able to unearth pictures of the two women showing that they had more of a relationship than what Katie McLaughlin testified to. The defense counsel sought to introduce photos showing the two women socializing, but those photos were inadmissible. So at the beginning of day five, before the jury is present, defense counsel stands up and asks the judge to reconsider entry of the photos and, and lets the judge know that since Katie McLaughlin testified, he's received numerous additional photographs from members of the public showing additional support for the fact that Katie McLaughlin and Caitlin Albert were a lot more friendly than she let on and that they hung out at additional social events and they even attended a baby shower as recently as 2021, eight months before this entire saga began. We learned that Caitlin Albert will be testifying and the defense counsel asked the judge to take the matter into consideration because it's going to come up again when she testifies. Well, the judge declined to rule on the request at that point and just pushed it off until a later date. As it currently stands, the end of day six today, it has not been raised again. So there's still no resolution to the matter of the witness, Katie McLaughlin. Now, I'm going to point out highlights that I noticed from each of the witnesses from days five and six. So once the Katie McLaughlin matter finished, we heard from Paul Gallagher, a lieutenant for the Canton Police Department. To sum up this man's personality on the stand, I would say it's smug. He kind of scoffed and just appeared to be just very incredibly defensive, so much so that you'd immediately started second guessing everything he was saying. At least I did. Gallagher was the highest ranking officer on the scene that day. Despite this, we learned that the first time he was interviewed about this case by anybody, including the Commonwealth, was a month ago. The state police who investigated the case didn't interview him. They never discussed his observations from the day, the process of collecting evidence, where the evidence ended up, about potential witnesses. Nothing. Well, not much better. Gallagher testified that he never wrote a report about the incident. Didn't take notes, didn't make voice memos, nothing. Is this how they conduct investigations in Canton? One can only wonder, how can you expect to remember that which is not fully documented? I'm of the age and stage right now where if it's not written down, I'm not remembering it. So I don't know how, as an officer of the law, you can think that, you know, your memory will just serve you years later when you need to actually testify about a matter. Well, Gallagher testified that never in his 30 plus years of policing had he ever processed a crime scene in the snow. And perhaps that's why he had the bright idea to use a leaf blower at the scene of the crime to blow snow in order to reveal evidence. He stated it was a controlled method of snow removal. Now, 
it seems absolutely ludicrous to take that action because I don't know about you, but I have blown leaves. We have many trees in our yard that constantly drop leaves. So we got just a leaf blower and I use it from time to time. And I can tell you when I'm blowing leaves, it seems anything but controlled. Leaves are flying everywhere. Not only leaves, but debris and, you know, dirt and whatever particles. I mean, who knows what's in there, what's getting blown around. So I can't imagine the extent to which the scene around where John's body was found was disturbed. Now, in blowing the snow, they did reveal blood stains in the snow. They found multiple spots of blood, as well as a broken glass, a a broken drinking glass. Bagging and tagging the glass, a hard object, would be easy, right? Okay, well, it was. But how would they preserve the blood stains? Somebody get a cup. Any cup will do. Even a red Solo cup. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, they put the blood drenched snow into six different red Solo cups. Why? They didn't have anything to put the blood in. Gallagher testified that it didn't even make sense to drive to the police department to get a proper container because there were none there. It just so happened that the neighbor across the street from 34 Fairview was a deputy deputy chief of police with a pack of unopened red solo cups. So that is what the officers from the city of Camden used to collect biological matter in what would be a death investigation. Unsterilized, uncovered party cups. Gallagher never saw John before John was transported away from the scene, but somebody described John's injuries to him. And since it appeared that John wasn't going to make it, Gallagher called upon the state police to come to the scene to start processing. See, there was a policy in place that any unattended deaths in Canton would be investigated and processed by the state police. So when Gallagher called the state police, he described John's injuries and said, quote, he may have been in a fight or whatever, close quote. That comment is critical to the defense's case because their theory is that John, in fact, might have been in a physical fight with somebody at the Fairview house. Now, when pressed about why he suggested John may have been in a fight, Gallagher downplayed it as as much as possible simply saying that it was only one possible explanation for the injuries that John sustained. But the fact is not lost on me that the ranking officer at the scene that day surmised that John could have very well been in a physical altercation. As the ranking officer at the scene, Gallagher directed others to do certain things. One of those directions was for Sergeant Lank to interview the people inside the house at 34 Fairview. Now, Gallagher knew the home belonged to the Albert family. Gallagher also knew that Sergeant Lank had a longtime relationship with the Albert family. Yet Gallagher testified that he had absolutely no hesitation in instructing Lank to get initial statements from those witnesses, despite there being an apparent conflict of interest. We learned that Gallagher went with Sergeant Lank inside the house where they spoke with Jennifer McCabe and Kevin Albert and other people. Now, it's important to note that never did Gallagher or any other officer seek to investigate the home, although it had been John O'Keefe's intended destination, and they knew it at that point. He testified that he didn't have probable cause to seek a search warrant for the home, but he could still have requested the homeowner's consent to look around the home and neither he nor anybody else asked for that permission. Next, we focused on another piece of critical evidence, Karen Reed's car. Now, testimony is not being given in a chronological way. There's a lot of jumping around, which makes it next to impossible to create a cohesive timeline. But we're introduced to the defendant's car which is an SUV, once it's inside the Canton PD's Sally Port, which I understand the Sally Port to be a sort of garage. 
So we see pictures of the rear of the vehicle juxtaposed with a brown grocery bag from Stop and Shop, which is a big grocery store chain in the Northeast. Inside, in a separate picture, inside the grocery bag, we see the six red solo cups. Now this bag is less than five feet away from the defendant's car. We can see with our eyes, though we're going to get testimony from Sergeant Lank, that this is obviously not a police evidence bag. And there's obviously no seal or evidence tape on the bag without which nobody can know how the contents have been contaminated or how the contents have been accessible to contaminate other things like an SUV taillight not five feet away. Believe me when I tell you, I am an objective viewer of this trial. I have no dog in this fight. I don't know half of the drama that's ensued before the trial actually started, but I know at this point, just based on the investigation by the Canton PD, which sloppy seems too kind of a term to use, but I can't think of anything else right now. There's reasonable doubt all over. I, I haven't come to an ultimate determination about the allegations in this case, but if the trial were to be over today, I haven't seen that the Commonwealth proved an iota of the allegations against Karen Reed. But this is only the beginning of week two. So I'm waiting to see what the Commonwealth will present in the upcoming days and weeks. The next witness the Commonwealth presented was Sergeant Sean Good of the Canton Police Department. Sergeant Good was working dispatch overnight when he got two 911 calls. The first one was around 5 a.m. It was Carrie Roberts, and she was asking if John O'Keefe had been locked up by the police because he was missing. The second 911 call came from Jennifer McCabe around 6 a.m., letting them know that she and the other two women had found John O'Keefe laying in the snow outside 34 Fairview. Sergeant Good ended up going to the scene himself where he met up with Sergeant Lank and they made contact with Brian and Nicole Albert inside the home. Sergeant Good said he didn't notice anything abnormal inside the home from his viewpoint either. When Gallagher was at the scene and asking for a leaf blower, it was actually Sergeant Good who drove to his own home to get his personal leaf blower and brought it back to the scene for Gallagher to use. Sergeant Good also used his personal iPhone to videotape Gallagher blowing the snow and took a couple pictures of the process. We saw a video of the snow blowing um, in evidence and we saw the pictures as well. On cross-examination, we learned that Sergeant Good was professionally and socially friendly with Kevin Albert and Christopher Albert. He admitted that there's a teamwork and dependability and brotherhood within the force. Sergeant Good testified that although he went inside the Fairview house, he never saw enough of it really to look around the house. He never saw it appropriate to look for signs of struggle or blood. He never went down to the basement to check, check that location out. And he never asked the residents why they didn't come out of their house to see what all this action is in their front lawn, their front lawn. We haven't been introduced yet to Brian Higgins, but that person has been brought up in multiple witness testimony. Brian Higgins is a federal ATF officer who has a satellite office inside the Canton Police Department. We got testimony that Brian Higgins is a close friend of the former chief of police, Chief Berkowitz, and that is who allowed Higgins to have an office in the building. Brian Higgins was also allegedly at the Fairview home the night of the 28th going into the 29th. Sergeant Good testified that around 1.30 that morning, before any of the 911 calls, Brian Higgins showed up at the police department. But Sergeant Good doesn't know why. They didn't speak. They didn't interact. 
And Sergeant Good said that it actually wasn't unusual for Brian Higgins to show up in the middle of the night. This witness also testified that he never heard Karen Reed admit to hitting John. Also, he was part of the team searching the area for physical evidence, and he never saw pieces of a red broken taillight on the ground or in the snow, anywhere in the vicinity. Finally, the defense attempted to raise questions about the reliability of the police report that he wrote. They brought up the fact that all the individuals involved had their full names spelled out in the report except for Brian Alberts. Also, everyone's home address is listed on the report except for Brian Higgins. The address used for him was the police department's address. So these could have either been oversight or intentional attempts to mask information. Now, day six continued with Sergeant Good's cross-examination, where the defense pointed out another anomaly in the police report. There were two different versions of the same report. We come to learn that one was the original report, and the second was a supplemental to the original report. The supplemental report included a picture taken at the scene of the crime that included a piece of red taillight that allegedly came from the defendant's car. On redirect, the witness clarified that the police computer system that creates reports automatically updates reports with pictures as they are added. So in the end, the defense's attempts to discredit Sergeant Good's police report on that basis was a big nothing burger. So on day five, at the end of the day, without the jury present, the parties conducted a voir dire of Sergeant Michael Lake. This is the individual that worked with the other officers at the scene of the crime and was directed to speak with the homeowners at 34 Fairview. However, Sergeant Lank has a long and storied history with the Albert family. He was close friends with Chris Albert, and through that friendship also knew Chris's brothers, Tim and Brian and Kevin. But Lank was closest to Chris. So there was an incident in 2002 that was discussed in Voir Dire that serves to raise the basis of a showing of bias or prejudice on the part of Lank. After the voir dire, the judge held that there was something that the jury needed to hear based on Lank's possible bias due to his long-term knowledge and friendship with Chris Albert. So on day six, we started with the judge telling counsel on both sides what they could and could not get into with Sergeant Lank on the stand. What the judge was doing was she narrowed the scope of what Lank could testify to. She wanted questions narrowly tailored to only show evidence of bias as it related to the Alberts, but not anybody else. Once that was discussed, Sergeant Lank took the stand for his direct examination. He arrived to the scene throughout the morning. He actually went to 34 Fairview, went inside the house three different times, he testified that he didn't see anything inside the house from his viewpoint that raised any suspicion of his. But what's important to know is that even though he knew there would be a death investigation because John was not going to survive, he never treated the situation accordingly. Each of the three times he went inside the house to speak with witnesses, it was more like a group conversation. There was no one-on-one -on -one interview Although everybody could have been segregated inside the house, nobody was. It's like literally what law enforcement is not supposed to do when interviewing witnesses. Next, they got into the incident that happened in 2002. Back then, Lank was a Canton cop off duty drinking that night. He testified that he was in his car when Chris Albert, his longtime friend from childhood, came up to him talking about there's these brothers that are trying to get into it with me. What should I do? While speaking with Chris, Chris spots the guys walking towards them. Lank gets out of his vehicle and approaches the guy trying to diffuse and calm the situation. Mind you, he had been out drinking that night too. Things got heated. A fight starts. Lank ends up punching one guy and spitting in the face of another guy, biting another guy. It's just pure pandemonium. 
the cops come and cuff one of the guys Link was fighting, but in the end, no arrests were made that night. So the next day, the two brothers who Lank fought went to the police department to file a complaint against Lank. The police department turned them away, told them to come back another day. But before they were able to go back to actually file that complaint, Lank hurried up and filed his incident report, which resulted in the brothers getting charges filed against them and being arrested. So the defense presented all of this to show the lengths to which Sergeant Lank will go to come to the aid of his childhood friend, Chris Albert. And the jury is left to insinuate, whether rightly or wrongly, that Lank would extend that preferential treatment to the rest of the Albert family, including those at 34 Fairview. There were so many more gems of information from Sergeant Lank, but one of the critical ones that could influence the case is Lank's testimony about the evidence, specifically the blood evidence that was collected in those red solo cups. He testified that he really doesn't know about the chain of custody for the evidence and that he doesn't know the procedure for entering evidence for its proper storage or security. So that was the end of his testimony. They did start the testimony of another witness, but did not get too far into that witness. We'll pick that back up tomorrow, which will be a full day of trial starting bright and early at 9 a.m. Thanks for joining me for this recap. Until the next drop, peace. Peace.